presentation of dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. By the Friends of Idaho Public Television and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. You know, I got lost with this bird, but without getting lost, I could never have found my way home. Coming up, I talk with award-winning author Helen McDonald about how she was able to soar above grief and loss with the help of a very special companion. That's Dialogue next. Stay tuned. Ten years ago, my father died suddenly. Stricken with grief, I fled from humanity. I ran towards things of death and difficulty. Spooky, pale-eyed, feathered ghosts that lived and killed in woodland thickets. I ran towards goshawks. Hello and welcome to Dialogue. I'm Marsha Franklin at the World Center for Birds of Prey in Boise with Griffin, this beautiful Swainson's hawk. You were just listening to a clip from a documentary on the PBS series Nature called H's for Hawk, a new chapter. It features my guest today, the falconer Helen McDonald. McDonald, as you will learn, spent nine months at this very center in 2001. Her first book, a collection of poetry called Shaler's Fish, was published that year. That was followed by another book, Falcon. But McDonald really broke onto the literary scene with her 2014 best-selling and award-winning memoir, H's for Hawk. It traces her emotionally raw journey after the sudden death of her father. Bereft, she turned to what she knew, training a bird. But not just any bird, a goshawk, a species renowned for its unpredictability. I sat down with McDonald at the 2017 Sun Valley Writers Conference to talk about her story. First, though, I wanted to know more about her connection to Idaho. Well, welcome. Welcome to Idaho. I understand it's not like it's old home day or anything, but you have spent time in Idaho before. I have. And people are often like, really? Why were you in Idaho? So yeah, I was here for about nine months in, I think, 2001. Uh, I was at the time working on a PhD um, in the history of science, and I was doing some research at the World Center for Birds of Prey in Boise, an amazing place. If you've not, if you've, you know, not been, you should go. Um, at the Archives of Falconry there, they have this incredible collection of historical falconry and bird of prey um, books and you know, memorabilia. Um, it was like a playground for me, you know, I loved it in there. And I spent nine months just, you know, going through these archives and, uh, yeah, and looking out at the mountains and, and the sagebrush. I mean, it was an, it was an environment that was so, un, you know, un, unusual for me. And I loved it there. I really did. I even vi visited Sun Valley Resort once, which was, you know, I loved it. And here I am again. This fascination or even obsession with birds started quite young for you. Why do you think bird as opposed to cat, dog, horse? Um, well, of course, my you know immediate response is because they're really cool. You know, they're like um, well, they're dinosaurs. You know, they're the remnants of the you know the great beasts that roam the earth. Only they're smaller and uh, feathered, uh, more feathered now. Um, but there's something about them. You know, they've had this relationship with humans for you know thousands upon thousands of years. First as religious um, you know icons really. And then as, as hunting partners, but they've never been domesticated. They've always been taken from the wild until quite recently and trained, you know, brought inside the house. So they've come to stand for us as these unalloyed fragments of, of wilderness and wildness. And there's something really astonishing about that. And if anyone, you know, ever gets close to a bird of prey and looks into their eyes, you know, there's something deeply magnetic about them. Um, and also, I'm really allergic to most mammals. So that's part of it, you know, get me near a horse or a dog or a cat and I start sneezing, but I'm fine with birds. So luckily enough, you know, that's, that's a good thing. I want to talk about your father now because of the nexus yeah. between the birds and the father. Um, he was a press photographer, yeah, a journalist. he was. And also both of you were, are observer types. You know, you shared yeah. a lot in common as yeah. daughter and father. Yeah, and I think that was kind of nice. I think you learn a lot from your parents about how to look at the world. My father and I were both total nerds, you know, when it, you know, he was interested in aeroplanes, I was interested in birds. We'd go out on these walks together, you know, and you know, with binoculars and 
we were really good friends. And I, I think, you know, one of the things that's interested me in the, since this book has come out are the number of women who've come to me and said, you know, we often talk about the relationship between mothers and daughters and between fathers and sons. But there's a very special relationship of friendship that, d that daughters and fathers can have that we don't talk about so much. And they really liked that that was, you know, such a big part of the book was that sense of, you know, that great love that can exist between fathers and daughters, yeah. He passed away suddenly. In fact, yeah. he was taking photographs. It, it sent, sent you into a tailspin. It did, it did. And it was a sudden death. He had a massive heart attack. And I think there's something about a sudden unexpected death that really tears the world in half for the family that's left behind. And, you know, and I hit upon this um, kind of idiosyncratic way of trying to deal with my grief. You know, not everyone who loses a loved one decides that what they're going to do is train a goshawk, <laughs> but that's what I decided to do. I was compelled. And I think after a loss like that, you're, you're driven by unconscious compulsions. You do things without even thinking about them. And it just seemed that what I wanted to do was to suddenly closet myself away from the world and live with this great wild creature. And you weren't novice, obviously. You, you trained yeah. many, many birds yeah. uh, since childhood, but not a goshawk. No, they had this reputation as being these murderous killers. And um, I didn't want to know. You know. I didn't want to train one. They were kind of macho, murderous creatures, like kind of feathered shotguns. And then my dad died, and I think all that rage and wildness inside myself, the wildness of grief, was really filling me up. And I realized that training a goshawk would be a distraction, but also... Um, I was just drawn towards this this creature of death and difficulty. As a well, it came response. to you in a dream, didn't it? And, yeah. And their dreams feature in your memoir quite... They do, and I remember a writer saying to me, you know, what were you thinking of? The, the, you know, you never write your dreams in a book. That's the last thing you do. You just don't do that. It's not cool. And I'm like, I didn't know. But yeah, the dreams were kind of the, the compass that was pushing me towards what I what I wanted or needed. and. Suddenly, all I could think about was goshawks. It's really weird. Your book, one of the reasons I love your book so much is it talks about words. And what I learned was that bereavement and raptor yeah. come from the same root that yeah. means to seize or rob, to right? To grip, yeah, to, to rob, yeah. To, be, to be bereaved, yeah, to, or, to, or raptor. Isn't it strange? So there how? is a connection yeah, yeah. going way back yeah, yeah. to the sense. Yeah. So um, you had this dream that you had to train a goshawk, and you went out uh, on the internet and purchased one for, yeah, for, it sounds, from a it sounds reputable. Worse. Yeah, it sounds um, worse than it was. I didn't just go to Craigslist and say, does anyone have a goshawk, <laughs> you know? So I, this guy was a very reputable breeder, and I wrote to him and I said, do you have a goshawk? And he said, yep. So I drove up to Scotland, waited for this bird that I knew would change my life, but I didn't really know how much. It was amazing, yeah. Her name is Mabel, Mabel, and that was intentional, yeah. again, coming from a, a root word. Um, a uh, a marvelous, meaning marvelous. lovable or dear. You know, you know, I didn't know I had all this Latin within me when I started you know, training hawks, but yeah, and I thought it was kind of weird that, you know, despite the fact that I wanted to cut loose from the world and tie my fate to this ravening wild creature, the fact that I named her after a word that meant lovable and dear, I think there was still some part of me that was very lonely and lost and wanted, wanted love, and it was a very weird place to look for it. But in the falconry culture, it's also important you don't uh, give your birds certain names, right? <laughs> yeah, this is so funny. So it's a tradition in falconry that if you give your bird of prey a very fierce name, like, you know, Slayer or Vulcan, it will just sit on a fence post and squeak at you and do nothing. But if you give it a cutesy name, it will become a proficient hunter. So yeah, I have a friend with a goshawk called Bunty. And I have a friend, uh, another friend who has a goshawk called Baby Doll, but even he thinks that's too much. And he calls her BD, you know, what was I thinking? So Mabel kind of fitted into this, you know, that, you know, if you have the most, the most frighteningly efficient hunters tend to have the cutest names. And these powers of observation that birds have and that you, you really honed your powers of observation during this time that you were training, to me, reflect in your writing because you are able to make so many comparisons with other elements of the natural world that somebody else might not even see. Wow. Yeah, it was quite a, I didn't know how to, I mean, it was quite a psychedelic experience. So at that point, I felt very unmoored. I didn't really know who I was anymore because of my father's death. You know, you become an orphan suddenly and the world is, you don't really understand how to read the world anymore. And that's one of the reasons the book's called Ages for Hawk. I, 
it's like a primer in how to you know read the world again after you, you, you becomes unreadable. Like a children's yeah, like a children's book. book. And what happens there also is I think that everything becomes new. The way that you look at the world, everything is incomprehensible and you have to find, try and think of new ways of describing it. So part of it was grief that I think made those things, the observations possible. And partly also, you know, I, um, I, I always wanted to be a painter when I was young. And I think even now when I look at a scene, I'm always trying to work out, you know, how the color values work. And I think a lot of the description in the book still comes from that, yeah. This, is, this training is so intense. Yeah. I mean, you, you locked yourself in a, in a darkened room for days, barely yeah. eating yourself, um, having her on your fist mm -hmm. for much of that time, mm -hmm. probably not sleeping for much of that time, but um, to train her to, first of all, ignore you, and then, and then come to you and, and take the food. It's it was a, incredibly intense. It is an intense experience, and it's, it's a very interesting one, because to start with, I mean, I wanted to withdraw from the world because I felt like I, I couldn't cope with the world out there. I was so miserable at the time. Um, and it's all done through positive reinforcement and gentleness. Quite often people sort of say, you know, falconry, isn't that like about dominating a wild creature? And I'm like, well, no, you know, what, what happens is that, you know, you, you have to earn their trust and you do that through, you know, gifts of, of raw steak, basically. There's not really any coercion, you know, when you fly a hawk free, you know, there's nothing stopping the bird just disappearing over the horizon. The fact that it comes back to you is like this wonderfully deep, um, it's just a very deep and emotional thing. So, but the first few days, the bird is very frightened of you, and your job is to reassure it, to be very calm, and eventually the bird will then jump to your fist for food and then um, fly to your fist for food, and then you go outside and put the bird in a long line, and the bird will fly to you, and eventually you take the line away, and the bird is free. But the funny thing was, I had to also get the bird used to people. And at that time, I didn't really want to see anyone. I mean, so I had to go out into the Cambridge city with this bird on my hand, um, and get her used to people, and it was hysterical. I mean, I'm sure some of your, you know, people watching this have been to Cambridge in England. It's a very eccentric place, but there are limits. And walking around with a goshawk on your fist is, yeah. I so, thought it was really interesting that the people who came up to you the most were what we, somebody might call outsiders, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Immigrants and other yeah, people Homeless who were, people, teenage goths, um, foreign students, kids. So interesting. You know. Everyone else would kind of walk right past, you know, this is a weird thing happening over here, we don't want to get involved. And quite often I'd hear sort of mums and dads say to their children, don't go near the hawk lady, dear, you know. And the little kids would run past and scream, Harry Potter, at me, because then I would be like, it's not an owl, it's a goshawk. I mean, it was hysterically funny. When you did release Mabel, that was so dramatic oh, in the book. Yeah. Is she going to come back? Yeah. So metaphorical too, but it... It was really well done. One was wondering, you know, because goshawks have a reputation of being a bit fickle, oh, very fickle. and flying away and just sitting in a tree yeah, for a while. Yeah, and there's a whole bit of the book where I, start, I sort of work out for the, fight, for the first time that a lot of the discussion about goshawks in old sort of 19th century falconry books is actually discussion by male falconers about women, right? So goshawks are kind of hysterical. You can't control them. They drive you crazy. They're like, they're fickle. You know, you get cross with them, and I'm like, oh wow, they're not really talking about goshawks, they're talking about women. <laughs> so, but the first time that she went free, yeah, I mean, all that you've been doing over the last, you know, gosh, you know, month of work is to try and build this relationship. And of course, because I was grieving, the idea that this bird would lose, would leave me as well, I was already deep in loss, was just almost unbearable. So when she came back to me, that was, you know, it was like, you know, I nearly fainted with relief, yeah. These birds, correct me if I'm wrong, are called cook's hawks because they, yeah. they do hunt very well. Um, they bring back, they can bring back quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, too much too, if you don't want your bird to get heavy, as I learned, you know, they need to be at a flying weight. Yeah. So part of what you do is you, you go out and you kind of truncate this a bit. When, when there's a kill, you go out and you um, make sure the bird does not eat too much and take, take some and stuff it in your special pocket, yeah. and then uh, and go home and eat it yourself too. Right, yeah, I was kind of living off the land quite a lot. I mean, I was very poor at the time, I had almost no money, so um, my diet was really weird. So I'd kind of haunt the supermarket reduced counter for stuff that was going out of date. And then I combined these items with, you know, 
the rabbits and pheasants that Mabel Pheasant caught. Pheasant pad thai. Pheasant pad thai. That was a great one, actually. That was a that was a that was became my signature dish. Um, but it was a really weird experience, like you know, because ironically, you know, there I was running away from death as fast as I could because the hawk to me represented this vital life, and yet, you know, ironically, goshawks are hunters, and I knew that I wanted to hunt with her because that's what goshawks do—they hunt. And I didn't want to stop her from doing that. And when goshawks catch things, you know, it's a fact of life that they're very powerful. They just grab hold of things and they just start eating. And at some point, as they start eating, the thing's going to pass away. So I had to run in there and put these poor animals out of their misery. And that was a that was hard, you know. I mean, I'm quite a soft person. I mean, I have no kind of illusions had, about life. You had to. I um, had to kill them. Break yeah. her yeah. necks or. Yeah, yeah, and and, and uh, so that was, um, you know, and it's it's hard to talk about death like this, but I mean, it, flying Mabel and watching her hunt and having to do this, finally taught me that biggest lesson about mortality, which is that none of us are here very long, and the boundaries between life and death are tiny, and that was that was a haunting realization. And it was starting to, you know, kind of. Yeah. So so when I was with the when I was become flying, quite yeah. confusing and. Yeah. and you know, Absolutely. brought you down. Yeah, so, so yeah, so what happened there is that when I was flying the hawk and she was, ca you know, flying around the countryside, I sort of felt like identified with her. I wanted to be like this hawk. I wanted to be this, you know, solitary, self-possessed, aerial creature with wings. I mean, I wanted to be her. I didn't want to be me anymore. But then when she caught stuff, I had this huge responsibility of having to do this, you know, the deed. And that made me feel accountable and human and deeply, deeply responsible for myself. And that was a really weird thing. But yeah, so I was getting lost on the wings of this hawk, but I wasn't thinking about my dad, I wasn't thinking about my, you know, anything apart from this bird. And I thought everything was absolutely fine. But weird things were happening. So I started to wake up in the morning and my pillow would be wet. And I'd been crying all night without knowing why. I mean, at one point I thought maybe I've got an eye disease. <laughs> it's ridiculous looking back on it. And I realized slowly that I was falling into a very deep depression because I was so cut off from my own feelings and from my family and from my friends and from the person I needed to be, which was a, you know, a real life you know, human, not this imaginary hawk. And it was at my father's memorial service that I realized what I'd done. I stood there at the lectern and addressed this audience of his friends and colleagues. And my heart broke. I realized I'd made this mistake that I'd thought that, you know, that all the nature books say that when you're broken, what you should do is go into the countryside, into the wild, and it will heal you. And there's truth in that, but I'd taken it way too far. I got completely lost. And I knew then that I had to come back from that beautiful but very dark, hawkish existence back to the world of people. I didn't perceive it as a mistake. I, I hear what you're saying. You yeah. went a little bit too far with yeah. it. Yeah. But in the end... No, it's interesting. When the book came out, I, there was a beautiful review by a woman called Laura Beatty, who's a wonderful writer. I don't know if you came across this. It's a good review. And she says in this review something that I never, ever thought. She said, look, this is a book about a trip to the underworld and back, and you come back changed. Um, so people sort of, you know, say, you know, ha your, this goshawk helped you with your grief. And I'm like, well, it's kind of more complicated than that. It's not a book like, I was sad, and then I got a cat and then I was happy again. You know, it's a much more complicated thing. You know, I got lost with this bird, but without getting lost, I could never have found my way home. And that's really how the book works, yeah. I couldn't help but think, you know, a, your father would be so proud of you, I'm sure. Yeah. And yet this could not have been done without his loss. It's really, really ironic. You know, my dad, you know, I was penniless for years. I was an academic historian. I was paid, you know, piecemeal. I wasn't, I had very little money. I remember one day I took my parents out for lunch and I paid and my father was so delighted that he took the receipt and he kept it on his mirror in, in the, in, you know, in the, in the front room of the house just to say, you know, that was the day my daughter actually paid for lunch for us. So the idea that this book would be a success and that, you know, that I would have enough money to kind of pay my bills now, he would have been delighted. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, the fact that he's not around to kind of share in the kind of joy of it all is... It's heartbreaking, yeah. yeah. I miss him to bits. He was a good man. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that your story is wound in with the story of T.H. White. Oh, the amazing writer, yeah. From the Once and Future, who wrote Once and Future King, yeah. you know, I mean. So Camelot, Camelot, com Camelot comes from that. There's the, uh, yeah, there's the, the, sword, yeah, the sword of the Stone, Stone which yeah. I read, you know, as a kid. And there's the Disney movie there. Right. Yeah. Well, um, he wasn't a Camelot. 
Um, he was a complicated soul. And yeah. in fact, um, was a quite tortured yeah. person yeah. and in some ways took it out on um, the birds that he tried to yeah. train, including a goshawk. A goshawk, so yeah. And so um, his story is kind of, it's both an anti antithesis to the way that you train Mabel, but there is some synthesis as well yeah. because both of you were looking to the birds yeah. for some solace. Right, and, and you know, he tried to train this hawk. He was buoyed on these sort of dreams of medievalism and glamour, and he was sort of, um, you know, very messed up in many ways. You know, he was gay, and it was like 19, you know, he was, this is like 1930s, it was a very difficult time. Um, he was very repressed, and he somehow saw the hawk as being, he wanted to be more like a hawk. He wanted to be kind of himself. He saw the hawk as something like his true self. And then as he was training it, he was trying to kind of trying to master this himself. And he made a terrible job of it. It's a very, very poignant, he wrote a book about it called The Goshawk. And it's, you know, like me, you know, we're very different characters, but he made this mistake of seeing the hawk as a mirror of himself. And I thought his story was very instructive because partly it's about how we can cause great harm and great hurt, not because we're bad people, but because we don't have the tools to know how to love either other people or ourselves. And I thought that was a, I, his story became more and more important as I, read the, as I wrote the book. And he ended up really haunting me. You know, he's an amazing character. There are plenty of joyous parts of this book. And one is where you and Mabel get to sit and watch TV together, yeah. including a program that many of our PBS viewers are familiar with, which is Antiques Roadshow. <laughs> yeah. That was my, a favorite. Yeah. My Gossok has watched more antiques roadshows and how, you know, real estate programs than any Gossok in the history of the world. We just had so much fun. And what I love about this book is people sort of sometimes say, you know, but your goshawk didn't have a truly wild life. And I'm like, you know what? In the wild, a goshawk will fly around, catch its dinner, and then go sit up a tree and digest it, you know, and snooze and go to sleep. My goshawk was the same, only rather than up a tree, she was watching Antiques Roadshow. I love that program. I love it. It gets so excited. Like, oh, how much is that worth? What is it? What is it? Yeah. Uh, Mabel is no longer alive. I know. It's sad as hell, you know. Um, I flew her for six years, six seasons. And she died very suddenly of a, an airborne fungal infection called aspergillosis, which is the bane of, you know, it kills a lot of wild goshawks and tame goshawks. It's, it's, they're very susceptible to it. It was a freak thing. And she died overnight, you know, no symptoms the, night, the day before and then dead in the morning. And I wet buckets, you know. She was, um, you know, people sort of say, you know, that people who have keep dogs is always the one dog of your life. And she was the one hawk, you know, I miss her a lot. And um, I wish she was still with us. But I did get to train another hawk this year. It's and very our, exciting. Our PBS viewers will also be able to see that, yes? You will be able to see me struggling with the stress of training another bird on television. So yeah, so um, I've done a documentary with some great filmmakers. It's a uh, PBS, BBC co-production. And in it, I train another goshawk for the first time since, uh, since Mabel. And I can, uh, you know, assure your, you know, the, the viewers that uh, it's very stressful training a goshawk, as you'll know if you read this book. But it's a lot more stressful training a goshawk with a film crew in the room. And I think it might be the first time that the actual, real moment-to-moment -moment training of a hawk and taming of a hawk has been captured like this. And it's astonishing that you know it's a it's a beautiful film, you know, and I'm really proud of it. Well, and there is somebody quite prominent who has optioned your book for a feature film. I know, it's so exciting. Um, uh, yeah, you know, Queen Cersei from Game of Thrones, Lena Headey, she's, she's optioned it. I've met her, she's wonderful. She completely gets the book. Um, I'm overjoyed that she's on, you know, doing this project. So I'm looking forward with bated breath, falconry pun, yes. uh, to how to how that pans out. I'm very Hopefully excited. Hopefully, you won't about be it. hoodwinked. I know. Let's just do the puns. <laughs> yeah. Is she playing you? I think she is. Yeah. What an honor. I know. It's. I just, you know, I'm speechless. It's. it's you know, when I, I wrote this book, I genuinely thought this is a really weird book. No one's going to read it. You know. When I finished it, it took me two days to pluck off courage to send it to my editor because it was such a strange book. And, you know, now they had this extraordinary Hollywood person playing me on screen. Amazing. No hawks for you right now, right? A parrot? If I, I read parrot. your Twitter feed, I've seen uh, 
pictures of your parrot? I have a parrot, yep. I have a parrot. Uh, it's hysterical. People say, you know, it's much more emotionally healthy to have a parrot than a goshawk. And I'm like, you know what? I have more injuries from that parrot than I ever had from, that from my hawk. Uh, the parrot's great, very, very affectionate, very cuddly, very vindictive, very funny, very clever. I don't have time to keep a hawk anymore. I'm, I'm traveling so much, but I'm really hoping that um, in future years when things calm down, there'll be another bird. You know, falconry is part of who I am. I'll always be a falconer, and I hope that one day I'll be out there again uh, watching a bird of mine soar through the sky. It's a very, very privileged thing to be able to do, and I love it. And you have a new book that you're writing. I've, I've seen it described by you as kind of a love letter to the English countryside. Well, I'm, I'm working on some uh, books at the moment, some sort of, it's all kind of, you know, very early stages. Uh, one of the things is a, a book of essays, I hope, that will involve a lot of kind of love letters to the English countryside. And then I want to do a book of essays and then a much bigger book after that, which may not be about England at all. So watch this space. It could be a very different kind of book. Um, so Would it have uh, animals in it, though? It will have animals in it. And I think, you know, the, no matter, you know, what I write about, my central subject, you know, we're living through the sixth great extinction right now. And I think my, the deep subject that all my books are about is about how we see the natural world and how we value it. And we need to know how we value the natural world in order to work out how we can save it, basically. So that's my subject. So, but it won't all be misery. I hope there'll be laughs in my new book. You know, it's not all going to be steady, depressing stuff. There'll be some humor and hopefully some fun as well. You know, I actually, uh, I really hate books that are about how terrible everything is or articles. I don't want to read them because it's so frightening. So I'm very interested in how we can think about drawing people into a very loving, intimate relationship with the, with the creatures around them, with the natural world that is in inspiring to go out and do something to help. You know, we have human spaces and we have the wild and there's not much interplay between them. And the further away the wild gets from us, the less we care about it. It becomes something on a TV screen. And one of the reasons I love falconry is because it's one of those very weird spaces where you can interact with a wild creature in a very enlightened way. And I think we need more animal-human contact. I'm very, very evangel evangelistic about this. Well, I'm sure you've helped a lot of people with their grief um, mm -hmm. reading this story. So thank you very much for taking the time to talk with me and by proxy our viewers, some of whom I'm sure are falconers. Oh, well you have some great falconers here, so hello to them and hello to everyone. It's been a joy. Thank you very much. Thank you. You've been listening to Helen McDonald, a falconer and the author of H's for Hawk. Our conversation was taped at the 2017 Sun Valley Writers Conference. McDonald was featured in a documentary on the PBS series Nature called H's for Hawk, a new chapter. For more information, check out the Dialogue website. Just go to IdahoPTV.org and click on Dialogue. For Dialogue, I'm Marcia Franklin at the World Center for Birds of Prey. Thanks for tuning in. presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. By the Friends of Idaho Public Television and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.